lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Well, I want to send a special welcome to our new members of our Still Growing listener community on Facebook, and they are Patty Donahue, Pam Ring, Bill Boyd, Maureen Fitzgerald, Carolyn Jantz, Darling Rutledge, Chandra Gruber, Amy Steinhauser, Deb Brandau-Ackerman, and Mary Lynn Kenknight. Welcome, you guys. And if you really like the show and would like to join them in the group, all you have to do is go to Facebook and search Still Growing Podcast Group on Facebook, and then just click to join. I know it'll say that it's a closed group, but all you have to do is click and request to join, and then I will admit you to the group, and that'll be that. You'll be part of the group, and it's a great place to interact with the guests that have been on the show, as well as other listeners. You can ask questions, share your garden stories, and it's also where I post all of the awesome promotions and giveaways for my guests and sponsors. So go ahead. I'd love to meet you in the Still Growing Podcast group on Facebook. And I also do my best to curate and post things that I think you guys would enjoy reading. And so this week, there's this really great post by Shayla Love on hydroponics at home and how you can try your hand at hydroponics by getting inspired with some very creative and really quite beautiful hydroponic gardens. They don't have to be ugly or unsightly anymore, and they're very easy to put together. And I just posted as well a very nice article from VegetableGardener.com called How to Grow Sweet Potatoes. It's a really cute little article. Article and it's very informative on sweet potatoes. And last but not least, I came across this adorable little post on how to paint glass or chalkboards with chalk paint because I love to use chalkboards out in the garden. And you can use chalkboards on everything from labeling plants to I painted on some of my fencing so that I can write little quotes on the header board that runs across the pickets of the fence. And I meant to share it last week. And then, of course, I ran out of time. So I will have it in the Facebook group this week. And if it's something you're interested in, go ahead, check it out. I think you'll really like it. And by the way, this was shared by the website Thrifty Little Things. And that website is written by Wendy Cohen. Well, now I want to make sure that you're getting ready for two upcoming episodes of Still Growing that I think you're going to really enjoy and that are super special and really fun for fall. And the first one is a spring bulb ordering party that I'm going to do right on the show with three fantastic guests and friends. And they are Jen McGinnis of the blog Frau Zinni. She was just on the show. So if you haven't listened, listened to that, go back and check her out. Uh, Julie Thompson Adolf of the blog Garden Delights, another great garden blog. And then Susan Vollenweider of the History Chicks podcast. And she's also a columnist for the Kansas City Star and she loves to garden. So these ladies are going to join me as we make our picks for spring bulbs from two catalogs, the Color Blends catalog and the Van England catalog. And as luck would have it, we have Tim Shipper from Color Blends and Joanne Vandenberg Ohm from Van England. And they're going to be on hand to talk to us about the choices that we're making, basically blessing our our selections. How great is that? And then pointing out something that we might have missed or overlooked. So if there's some new things or exciting things in the catalog that maybe we should have paid more attention to, they're going to point them out to us. And then, of course, offer some spring bulb planting tips. So it's going to be a super fun episode. I'm really looking forward to it. And you can prepare by making sure that you get your color blends and Van England catalogs and order those today because you're going to want to have them with you as we go through them. You'll just go through the catalog with us and then you can make your picks and have a beautiful spring display of bulbs in your garden for 2017. 
Now, before I introduce today's guest, I want to make sure that I talk one more time about our upcoming book club for All the President's Gardens by Marta McDowell. Now, Marta is going to be on an upcoming episode of Still Growing, but in the meantime, I thought it would be really fun to read the book together, so we're going to be doing it on an online book club format. And of course, you can find out about that by going to the Still Growing Facebook group, where on September 1st, I'll be posting information about our very first reading assignment. And I want to make sure that I cover just a few things that I found about this book that I thought were really charming and sweet, just to kind of whet your appetite. The first is right in the preface where Marta is writing how she came to the task of writing about the gardens of the White House because it provides a little insight and a little behind the scenes of how this book came to be. And here's what she wrote. This is the very first thing she writes. The United States was too big, for a topic that is. When my editor suggested I might write a history of American gardening, I sat at my desk, stunned. It seemed a subject broad as a sea of grass, long and muddy as the Mississippi, elusive as a white whale that would, after a mad, obsessed chase, drag me under. Isn't that so relatable? Now, obviously, eventually she goes on to talk about how she narrowed down her topic to the gardens of the White House or the presidential gardens. Now, before I share the last excerpt with you, I want to make sure that I share with you a little bit more about what you're getting into here, especially if it's been a while since you've been in a book club or maybe you've never been in a book club. Uh, This particular book, from the cover to the back and all the pages in between, there are tons of pictures and drawings and illustrations and anecdotes, lots of sweet little additions that make this book a pleasure to read. It is far from a heavy history textbook. There are illustrations of the beautiful gardens. There are explanations about how things evolved over time. There's tons of little memorable vignettes and stories about how the gardens came to be and the decisions that were involved in the creation of some of these gardens. So the plan is that we will cover about two chapters a week, which is a very doable pace with this particular book given all of the images and anecdotes that are already built in. So now I'm just going to wrap this up with a quote that Marta uses at the very end of the preface. And she says, long-term White House head gardener Irvin Williams once said, what's great about the job is that our trees, our plants, our shrubs know nothing about politics. And then Marta concludes that despite the presidential focus of the book, She's attempted to emulate the politics of plants because whether gardeners lean left or right, blue or red, we are united by a love of green growing things and the land in which they grow. So I hope you'll join me. Uh, in the book club of Marta McDowell's All the President's Gardens. Go ahead and get it today on Amazon or at your local bookstore and get ready to dig into a great garden history book and the very first book of the Still Growing Book Club. Well, today's guest is someone that I've gotten to know over the past couple of years. She's a fellow Minnesotan, a fellow master gardener, and she's the author of three books. Her first book, A Lawn Chair Gardener's Guide, is what originally drew me to her. And then she followed that up with a couple of children's books. The great book, Thank You Bugs, which is a fun rhyming book for toddlers and preschoolers about the positive and negative effects of bugs. And then Mason Me meets a Mason B, which of course features her own son as the main character in the book, and it's absolutely adorable. And it is what she has now based her puppet show on, and she is charming elementary school students all over the state of Minnesota, and now that curriculum is available for elementary teachers everywhere. She's developed it into a K-5 through curriculum for teachers. So I'm talking about none other than Dawn Pape, and I 
knew I would get to know Dawn when she came out with her first book called Lawn Chair Gardener. I love the title. I thought it was fantastic. And now if there's one word that represents that book, it's the word balance. And balance is so important for gardeners. So when Dawn is talking to gardeners, she's asking them to take a relaxed approach to gardening and have rounded lives. And that's what resonated with me and why I wanted to get a hold of her. Because as the mother of young kids, I knew I didn't have hours on end to spend in the garden. Well, hello, Dawn. Welcome to Still Growing. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Well, I am so excited that we get the chance to chat again because you and I kind of met back in 2013. So it's been a long time. And yes, we were planning, yes, and we were planning on doing an interview back then, and then it just never materialized. And so now we're finally having that conversation. And the last time we spoke was right before you came out with your children's books, Thank You Bugs and Mason Meets a Mason Bee. And before we get started, why don't you tell us a little bit about your life and your love of nature? I am a mother and I have two boys. I have uh, my son Mason is seven and my son Maxwell is four and a wife. And I come from a long line of gardeners. My grandmas were both fantastic gardeners and my family are also farmers. So I feel like we're, I just have it in my genetic makeup to be close to the earth. Um, I, I grew up swimming in, in Crooked Lake every day from May to September when it really was too cold to swim. Um, but uh, and then we went camping a lot as kids. Both my grandparents had woods around their houses. And so I spent lots of weekends just sort of running around in the woods. And I guess I never really was taught environmental things. I just was in nature quite a bit. I was really lucky, I think, to have that kind of uh, upbringing. It I sounds think it's, idyllic. Now, you have to tell for people who are not familiar with Minnesota where Crooked Lake is. Crooked Lake is in Coon Rapids. There's probably 100 Crooked Lakes. Uh, I know my parents have a lake <laughs> place now in Wisconsin on a Crooked Lake, but it's not the same Crooked Lake. So it's, yeah, it's in Coon Rapids. It's it's interesting because it was kind of a pivotal part of my growing up, too. In high school, the beach closed, and it was too polluted to swim there anymore. That was kind of like the end of my childhood right there. And it was a huge eye-opener for me, and it really spurred on, I think, my whole life view right now. is, is The closing of that beach was really traumatic to me. Wow. And, um, and I searched for answers, and I couldn't understand. And, you know, now I understand that it was the septic system than it used to be people's lake houses were up there from the Twin Cities 100 years ago. And uh, that was out in the in the middle of nowhere. And so it really changed my worldview. And in high school, so I went to uh, Germany as an exchange student. And I was blown away by the fact that <laughs> their, their garbage cans that they put out by the curb uh, each week was the same size as our family's bathroom garbage. Yes. It was just you know, about 10 inches high. And it was just, it blew my mind. And it just showed me that there's a different way to live. So those things really kind of were formative for me and, and headed me on this path that I've been on ever since, since high school. So just a couple of years, you know. Yeah. Well, and now, of course, what you were alluding to is that Coon Rapids is a suburb of yes. the Twin Cities. So you you would have no idea that this used to be a remote place. You'd just feel like you were in another suburb around the, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. And uh, to go up north, you have to go considerably further out than than you used to when you and I were little. Um, so, But it's so fascinating to me that that the closing of that lake was really a pivotal moment for you. Yeah, and I guess I didn't realize it at the time. It's one of those things that uh, you look back and say, oh, yeah, that changed me, didn't it? Yes. So. Very yeah. powerful. Well, you know, your your first book and the book that drew me to you initially was called Lawn Chair Gardener. And I loved that title. I loved the cover of the book. I love the colors. And it refers to a more relaxed approach to gardening. Tell us about it. Yes, absolutely. Well, lawn chair gardener, first off, does not mean that you're going to live next to the Clampets. For those people who remember, like the uh, that show, <laughs> what was that? What was that show called again? The um, Beverly, Hillbillies. Beverly Hillbillies. We're dating yes. ourselves here, Don. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
I, I just saw reruns of it, you know. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, it's 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 not it's not no maintenance, but I guess I even before I was married, even before I had kids, I didn't want my garden calling the shots. I didn't want to be guilted into limiting my vacation. To, uh, so I had to come home. I didn't want to have to line up a caretaker to t- take care of my plants. So that's kind of what lawn care gardener is, that you you control it. And I really am always looking for balance in life. That's one thing I struggle with. I'm a, I, you know, I, I dive right into things. I want to do as much as I want to do, not as much as the garden demands of me. My husband puts it, he always has such a great take on things. He is kind of analytical. And he says that it's I get eighty percent of the benefit for twenty percent of the the effort. That's a great way to put it. It's the old eighty yeah. twenty rule. Yeah, the eighty twenty rule exactly. Once you find balance in yourself, you can find balance in the world. I just feel so good about creating habitat and providing food for people and wildlife, and um, protecting and conserving water and you know, reducing my carbon footprint by growing some of my own vegetables and feeding my neighbors, giving some to the food shelf when I, when I can, whenever I can, you know, and healthy food reduces obesity and obesity is related to diabetes rates. And, oh gosh, it all just starts in our own backyard. It's just a wonderful way to be. I guess I strive to be more of a lawn chair gardener too, because um, I have to force myself just to sit down and relax sometimes. <laughs> I'm too busy writing books and running after my children. But wow, when I get a chance just to take a cool drink and sit out on my lawn chair and just enjoy it all, oh, that's that's the way to live. At the beginning of your book, I love that you included one of my favorite gardening quotes by Thomas Jefferson. And it's the one that says, though an old man, I am but a young gardener. And that's because we are all learning all the time as gardeners. There's so much to learn. You can't possibly know it all. I always laugh because in the fall, my botanical Latin is pretty good. And I remember the names of my plants and I, I, I know what, where things are. And I feel like I have a good handle. And then I go through the winter and I come out in the spring and I can't remember anything. And I see plants coming up and I can't recall what they are. And so it's like, oh my gosh, I, I have total amnesia here, but we're constantly learning and growing. You know, there's such a difference between a new gardener and a seasoned gardener. Or my friend Judy and I would always joke, okay, we're like in our junior year of gardening now, or, you know, next year we'll be seniors. Or, you know, we always said we were in the same class of gardening because I think by the time we met, we both, we were like in seventh grade because we had both been gardening seven years. So she was always so cute about that, but there is so much to learn and And I'm very curious because you are a writer and writers are usually readers. So what are your favorite resources to help you continue to learn and grow about gardening? Oh, my gosh. I'm looking at a whole shelf of books behind me. I'm kind of a bookaholic. I I really can't get enough of them. I have too many to mention, really, I guess. (laughs) Um, But I also a master gardener, and uh, I love the extension resources because I, I trust them. Those are based on fact and science. Crown bees, you know, I've been really into pollinators and crown bees out in Seattle. They really specialize in mason bees. They have an amazing website and resources and PowerPoint presentations for people to use. Uh, just tons. The Heather Holmes book, A Pollinators of Native Plants, is, yes. is fantastic. The Blue Thumb website, actually, you know, I must confess here, I helped start the Blue Thumb program, Blue Thumb Planting for Clean Water program when I worked at a watershed district. But that one strives to have all the resources people need to get started and, you know, find a landscaper if they need it, find who sells native plants, find find all the resources. So that's always a good one. I've been interested in uh, year-round gardening now. And Nikki Jabor's year-round vegetable gardening book was really like my mentor book. You know, I, I kind of sat down like that with a text as a textbook, and that's how I got started with that. What are your big takeaways from that book? Year-round gardening, is, especially in cold climates where we live in here in Minnesota, and it's basically a refrigerator 
the year-round gardening is a little bit of a misnomer because you don't water or weed when it's cold and things are frozen. You just are keeping it alive in, in a warmer place. So it's basically a refrigerator. And you grow everything, start planting it about now in August, and um, late August, and you get things pretty much full grown in the fall, and you just keep them, and you can eat salads and stuff all year round. And it's for cold things. You're not going to grow tomatoes in Minnesota outside with no heat source in the winter. So, no, but it would be more for like lettuce or spinach. lettuces, kale, spinach. I mean, it's my it's salads. You know, I mean. Broccoli and, and things like that, cauliflower, perhaps, but those things are kind of touchy to grow anyhow. I just stick to the easy stuff. Make myself feel accomplished, you know? Yes. <laughs> and it really depends on the year, too, because even if you have this cold frame or some type of hoop house or what have you, um, if it's brutally cold out and we've got piles and piles of snow, you've still got to trudge out there to get your yeah. salad. And sometimes you might just decide, well, it's just easier to go to the grocery store. That's the funny thing, too, is when I sometimes people, when I tell people about my year-round garden, people are either excited about it or mystified. Some people act like you don't know that there's a super target just a few miles down the road that sells <laughs> produce all year round. That's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> or right. they're just like, wow, that's so cool. <laughs> tell me how I can get started. Oh, that's great. So it's one way or the other. Twitter is another one of my favorite resources these days. Twitter. I, uh, I can't believe what a fan of Twitter I am these days. So just getting all kinds of interesting headlines about stuff to read. And yes. wow, there's a lot to know. Well, so. you know, I can't let any gardener mention Twitter without discussing or at least giving a shout out to Bryn Haas. Because, of course, she does garden chat on Monday nights. And she is a voracious Twitter poster. And she swears by it. Uh, uh, she was sitting with me at a, at the Garden Bloggers Fling, and she said, I just love posting about a plant on Twitter and asking for help. And she goes, the next thing you know, you're talking to a rosarian or you're talking to, you know, a garden supply person or, or you know, a grower in another part of the country. And, and they're happy to give tips. So she swears by it. So give oh, it a try. So what's her handle? Her name is Bryn Haas. And okay. I don't know her Twitter handle um, I'll just find her. off the top of my head. If you search hashtag garden chat, that is her hashtag. Okay. And she has a website, I think it's Creative Living and Growing with Bryn Haas. And she does this uh, garden chat on Monday nights on Twitter. It's fantastic. You've got to give it a try. Oh my gosh, I am so there. Creative Living and Growing, that's what I'm all about. Yeah, there you go. There <laughs> I you know go. that. That's what done. that's the wonderful thing about gardening is that you know within an instant that you have so much in common with someone. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's a, I always say it's a great way to vet people. I mean, yep. by the time they're coming into your garden and they're saying, "I'm a gardener too." You're you're all, you're halfway to being great friends. So, uh, yep. That's for sure. Absolutely. Well, along those lines, if you were to advise gardeners out there who are interested in taking a more hands-off approach to gardening this year, what advice would you would make your top five list? Oh, top five only. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm going to have to uh, be a little briefer than I usually am, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, I guess, you know, the right thing, the first thing I would say is the right plant in the right place. Uh, and and get the soil right before you do anything. That's just basic gardening, um, but boy, that gets ignored so much. You know, I, I know so many people who say, oh, it's just not growing. I've tried replanting it there four times, and I'm just like, well, you know, how how do you expect different results? What's that Einstein quote about um it's like, like insanity is expecting insanity, a different result. Yes. Yeah, yes. exactly. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, and so so the right plant. So, um, you know, one plant that comes to mind is is lawn grass. Everyone loves a, a nice place to picnic and play and everything. But I have planted fine fescues right in my sandy, sandy, sandy soil, and they don't hardly ever need to be mowed or and never watered. They have really long roots. And so we save a lot of, of water here. And so the right plant, plant in the right place is great. And then just getting the soil right. A friend of mine 
just kind of jumped the gun and planted strawberries, and now she's ripping them out because her, she didn't get the soil right. It was too clayey, okay. and then, and her strawberries are just not working. So all that time and money, you know, ah, oh, that's so much work. Another thing I would say is redefine what weeds are. Uh, native plants are considered weeds to a lot of people, uh, but boy, they're easy to grow. A lot of perennial plants in general are just so easy. Uh, you plant them once and then you can uh, do very little with them. So I'm a big fan of of, of perennials and I, I have a strong bias towards natives since they provide so much nectar and pollen for our pollinators that are struggling so. And in that vein, uh, learning to love insects is really important and learn who's beneficial and what's not. And generally, if you don't spray, then the good guys will just take care of the bad guys. And there's almost never a reason to have to intervene. I, I learned that from a master gardening course once, and I thought it was just so profound that uh, the more you let nature take care of things, the less you need to intervene. And, and the more you do intervene with sprays and things, the more it becomes a vicious cycle of needing to spray more because there's no good guys to patrol the bad guys anymore. Yes. You know, I was just speaking with Benedict Van Heems this morning uh -huh. uh, out of the United Kingdom, and he is in charge of the Big Bug Hunt, which is a an app, a tool that they're using for pest prediction. And he made the same comment that the good bugs and the bad bugs have the symbiotic relationship and mm -hmm. you don't want to throw it out of balance. You know, you need both. Um, yeah. And, and one attracts the other. So sometimes when Absolutely. you have, you know, the bad bugs that are driving you crazy, well, it's basically a beacon to having their uh, predators come into your garden, which is exactly what you want. Yep. So people who keep too tidy of a garden, um, they're kind of just shooting themselves in a foot, creating so much more work for them and, and it's such a vicious cycle. So yeah. Oh, it's so nice to hear other people with that same idea and same message. It's something my grandma taught me. She, uh, she died a long time ago now, but she knew that kind of wisdom, you know, 90 years ago, I guess, when she was little. Companion planting is another way to live the launcher gardener life. Uh, so companion planting, you plant things that do well together. And boy, companion planting had me stymied for years. I, I set out to master it for a number of years and I had these big thick books and every time I would read them, I would fall asleep because <laughs> in it, they inevitably turned into just lists and lists and lists of plants. And I thought, oh my gosh, who can, I don't have a photographic memory. Who can memorize all this? Um, and then I just saw some groupings that what tastes to good together, what you cook with a lot of times is what you plant together. So like basil and tomatoes and, and some of those kind of simple things. And then I also found a, a pattern that vegetables, herbs, and flowers, if you just keep those three things together, you know, if plant those things in proximity then you've got a good start for companion planting. So, and some of the books talk about what's going to happen if you plant these two wrong plants by each other. And then I thought, wow, I've been planting those things together for, for years and, you know, nothing bad has happened. So I don't worry about too much, like being too wrong about it. So I think those are the, the first things I would dart off with for, for people. Now, one of the things that I think that is something that is, you know, some people frown on, but it, the reality is, is that gardening is work and that some people hire help or get help oh to gosh. assist in the garden. I know I do because, you know, I'm 46 now. I've got four kids and I can't afford to go out into the garden for eight hours and completely wreck myself and then be able to come in and make supper and mother four teenagers and, <laughs> you know, take care of the dog and all the things that happen. And so I really pace myself, but I do have help in my garden. I look for, you know, kids that are interested in helping. And oh. 
it's nice. Yeah. And it's a great, great assist for me. And I figure at the same time, you know, student gardeners are learning as well. You know, a lot of my kids that have helped me in the garden over the years end up, you know, working for a landscaping company or they go work for a sprinkler company or oh, they, how work fantastic. A, yeah, they work in a garden center and they know, you know, they've had a good foundation because they're actually working in a garden. But it's a common situation where people have a garden and they start to recognize that, wow, I cannot do all of this by myself, I need to get some help. What are your thoughts on this, getting help in the garden? If people need help, of course, they should get help. I guess I've had, well, I guess in general, I try not to get it to the point where my garden is too overwhelming. That's the launch our gardener name, you know? Yes. I, I try to do things, plan ahead so things are easy, and, and, I, and I use mulches uh, so in straws. So I don't have to weed as much and, you know, I don't do things that need to look perfectly trimmed and things like that. That They have a lot of give, I guess. But when we moved into this 1985 house that we have right now, they just love the landscape rock. And I am not a fan of the landscape rock. I don't like how it feels on my hands. I don't like the sound of it on the shovel. And we had so much landscape rock to remove. It was so overwhelming for for years so I definitely hired my nieces and nephews who were then in high school at the time to help me and my nephew Ben helped me rip out some junipers that's now a strawberry patch and that is actually a very funny story um, as soon as he was out there these neighborhood girls started walking by and I'm like oh hi girls and they walked by, hi, and, you know, they're probably in junior high at the time. And then a couple minutes later, they walked by the other way, oh, <laughs> hi, girls, you know, and then I was like, huh. And like half an hour later, they were, they walked by with some dogs, you know, and then I'm like, oh, yeah, they're walking their dogs. And then not too much later, they walked by with some more dogs. And I'm like, okay, I recognize those dogs, and those are not their dogs. They're borrowing people's dogs so they can walk by my very handsome nephew, Ben. So um, it was hilarious. And Ben just was oblivious to it all. He didn't notice that it was the same girls. He just said, wow, you have a lot of walkers around here, you know, and you seem to know everyone. I'm like, hmm, well, I just know those girls. But yeah, I was waiting for you to say, and then they came by with their swimsuits on. Oh, well, I think they were too. I think they were they were in junior high, and I think they were too self conscious to do that. Although they should have, you know. But yeah, then oh, that was just so so funny. But I guess another thing is I do I keep a clean edge, and so sometimes it might be mayhem in the middle of the garden, but it, it looks it looks nice from the from the the street to from a distance or. From my viewing, um, I, I seem to look at my gardens from my kitchen windows probably more than anywhere. <laughs> well, absolutely. So when I'm out there, too, and I look at, oh, my God, I just let this garden get away from me. Oh, what do I do with this? I just make a little goal, and I say I'm going to get this much done today, and I'll do the rest tomorrow. And sometimes tomorrow never comes, but I get it done well enough. So, And I also, you know, I think there's good enough. For a long time, I um, I didn't want to have people over until my garden was, like, quote, done. And I just realized it's never going to be done. A gardener is never finished. It's going to be good enough, you yeah, know? That's exactly so, right. Now, yeah. Dawn, I have to ask about this clean edge you mentioned. I want to mm -hmm. know what's your strategy for having a clean edge? What do you do? Well, I, I weed the edges more than the middle a lot of times. <laughs> and um, I also, like, you know, I, I, uh, I have a lot of native plants, and some of them get tall and, and lanky, and I stake them when they're on the edges so they don't fall over and they don't look messy. I'm kind of a neat nick, even though I do native plants, which is sometimes a little mind-boggling to people, I think. Um, and, and I also keep a grass strip between the street and my garden. I don't plant right up to the street because sometimes I can just look messier. And if there's an intentional grass strip, it really kind of tricks the eye into making it seem very intentional and not just like a weedy mess. Now, do you grow Joe Pieweed by any chance? I am looking out the window at like 
a rain garden full of Joe Pye weed. It's taking over, actually. I need to, it's so pretty right now. <laughs> oh, it is absolutely gorgeous. Yes. I, I have it throughout my garden. I mean, you know, once you have that Joe Pye weed, yep. you're going to have that pretty much all over your garden at some point. Mm-hmm. It's, it's easy to pull. It's like mint to me. So it's not a mm-hmm. big deal. If you don't want it, you pull it. I'm really contemplating uh, how I want to handle this this year. I had a, a stand of Joe Pye weed and it looked fantastic. Well, now it's flopping over like the peonies do. Mm-hmm. Oh, and yeah. I'm thinking, okay, I don't know how long I can handle looking at that before I just want to, you know, cut it off. How do you mm-hmm. handle your, your Joe Pye weed when it gets to be this type of time of season and it starts to get real floppy and moppy? I, uh, yeah, I just use all kinds of, uh, strange devices and whatever I have laying around in the garage. Oftentimes, Oh, I see a goldfinch sitting on my Joe Pye weed right now. Oh, they're fantastic, <laughs> aren't they? Um, yeah. So, but a lot of times I use uh, fishing fishing line because it's yeah. almost in, invisible, and I just like string it around there and tie it up like a bow, or you know. And then you know, on different gardening website, they sell all these kind of different supports. I pretty sure I own one of all of them. (laughs) And, you know, I stake them and use Velcro ties to the pole at times. And sometimes I take like a whole group of flowers and I use fishing wire, fishing line to kind of yank a whole group of flowers up and over and anchor it somewhere. So it's kind of like a booby trap once you go into the garden sometimes. So it keeps the deer out that way as well because they don't want to get entangled in all that mess. They yeah, get in there true. once and they realize, oh, I'm not doing that again. You're like, so. not going into this garden again. <laughs> yeah, she's crazy. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I like about your book, Lawn Chair Gardener, is you have a personality assessment in there. We've kind of touched on this a little bit, you know, the little quirks that we can have about how we want our gardens to look. And in chapter four, you offer a garden relationship quiz that helps people snag the garden garden of their dreams through 10 questions, 10 basic questions that you ask them. And then from that, they can draw some insight and clues about the way that they should probably garden for ultimate happiness. Yes. So can you walk us through some of the questions and then maybe some of the outcomes that you recommend for people? Oh, absolutely. Um, I actually wrote that part of the book because I was struggling to find a way to introduce different garden types without having it just be boring to read, to read more like a, you know, a fun book rather than just a textbook and just dry information that there's this type of garden that does this and this and this. (laughs) So that just seemed really boring to me. And so at some point it occurred to me that I don't know. I think a lot of us women, maybe men too, I uh, like to take these relationship quizzes. And I always think of plants as people. It's Mm -hmm. a very strange habit, but I just see them as like little personalities out there. It just seemed like a natural thing for me to do is to see these relationships, you know, with your garden. And, and, um, and so I just would say stuff like, uh, you don't want a controlling garden, something, someone who's going to dominate your time, kind of a bad relationship that you start feeling resentful about and things like that. And well, maybe you want to do some native gardening, a garden that will just kind of be more uh, self-sufficient and be there when you need it and, and supportive, but not be demanding of your times. And so I, I just kind of uh, introduced the different benefits of my favorite types of gardens. I start out that chapter saying I am trying to set people up with the types of gardens that I like, green gardens and native gardens and shoreline stabilization and edible gardens. So all functional things, something that gives back to the world. So like the second question is, it's important to me that my garden plants have a job or a vacation. They're not just trophy ornamentals. I call ornamental plants a lot of times like the Kardashians of the plant world. So, uh, <laughs> so, you know, if, if, if 
if that's important to you, yes, no. You might consider edible gardens, which provide food, and rain gardens, which filter stormwater runoff, and native gardens, which provide uh, beauty while also requiring very little maintenance. The shoreline stabilization gardens that can help maintain healthy lakes and rivers. So the relationship was my way of trying not to be boring, I guess. <laughs> well, and it's kind of a nice, easy way to start to explore areas of design that are probably a good fit for, you know, the person that's completing that little assessment, because there are so many different ways that you can go with gardening. It's so personal. It um, is. And, but yet it's important to try to figure out your niche because it makes it a lot easier. If you can narrow down what works for you, what you like, your preferences, mm-hmm. Um, then you have some direction when you're going to the garden center or the nursery and you're trying to select plants. So, um, you know, I there's a, a garden blogger that I really love to read, Pam Pennick, and she loves spiky plants. Well, then I mm. just interviewed someone the other day who's like, I hate spiky plants. Well, guess what? Pam Pennick, maybe not for you. But if you love spiky plants and I love spiky plants, then you're going to probably enjoy reading Pam Pennick's blog. Interesting. Yes. It is so personal uh, how people decorate. And you can just see when you walk up to someone's house that they have a, a pot of red geraniums on, on, their, on their front porch. You know so much about them. Or if they have some tall dough pie weed, there's another so many things you know about them too and what they like and how, how they handle relationships probably. Well, I loved your chapter on minimal fall or spring cleanup. Do you think people spend too much needless energy in the garden during those times of year? Well, I guess I don't want to be a person to judge how other people spend their time. You know, I just think that a lot of people just want to be outside and that's what they know. They know how to mow. They know how to fertilize. They know how to rake and and it, it gives them some sort of feeling of completeness or just they it's logical. They understand it. But for me, that's too much energy. That's not what I want to do. You know, I don't like being outside to do those types of chores necessarily. A little bit fine, but not too much. So um, I guess what concerns me more than people's time is the amount of resources it takes for traditional yard care. You know, a quote that just blew my mind is that more people have been born in the last 50 years than in the previous 4 million years. Wow. That's mind-blowing. The number of people, you know, thousands of people are going to be put onto the earth during this interview. You know, all these precious lives around the world. And so I think it's just, I feel a personal responsibility to uh, use resources very wisely, not use any extra water on something that's not going to be eaten by either my family or or wildlife to give back as much to the world as I can. So another kind of like mind changing idea is that the biggest crop in the United States isn't what people might expect. It's not corn. It's not wheat. It's not soybeans. Those are our three largest agricultural crops, but the largest crop according to NASA satellite imagery is actually lawn grass Hmm. and we can't eat it. You know, it does provide a play space and a picnic space. But sometimes I wonder if the only time we go out to our yard is to mow it. Do we really need that area as lawn? (laughs) Could it be something else? Something that gives back to the world? Something that takes so many resources? I guess that's my thoughts more than anything. And yeah, perennials are just so darn easy. The insects and the birds like it if you just leave them up all winter because it gives them a spot to have homes and and nest over winter inside the stems. I think it looks nice to have the snow falling on dead flowers and the the birds definitely like those seeds and everything. And then the spring, um, kind of wait for those insects to emerge. Don't jump the guns too fast and just whack them down. Uh, I take a hedge trimmer, actually. I used to use a weed whipper, but um, I take a hedge trimmer just whack all those thick stems down. It feels very powerful to do that (laughs) and rake them up onto a tarp and haul them away to a compost site and done. You know, it's, it's pretty simple. 
Well, I also love that you're a cooking gardener because one doesn't necessarily mean the other. I mean, you can be a great cook and not a gardener and a great gardener and not a cook. So um, you're not a fussy cooker either, which I appreciate because you don't want to work for hours in the kitchen in the same way that you don't want to work for hours and hours outside in the garden. And you are attracted to quick and easy ideas and recipes for things like main dishes and soups and salads. And I'd love to hear some of your favorite recipes? Oh, yeah. If I'm an, a lawn chair gardener, I'm probably an armchair cook, I guess, because, yeah, I, I I love eating healthy. Boy, it's, you know, everyone knows that exercise, sleep, and diet are, are key pillars to a healthy life. And slow cooking, I think there's so much to that. But fast and, and easy and something that my kids will eat is really important to me. So in the summer, oh boy, I love gazpacho and Greek salad, um, this zucchini summer squash um, that I used with a spiralize, do with a spiralizer. That's not in the book, and but I wish it were. It has mint and lemon and garlic in it, and that is tasty, and it takes all of 10 minutes to make. So those kind of things are my kind of cooking, you know, nice. really healthy, fresh stuff. And in the winter, my crock pot is my best friend. It's my butler. It has dinner ready for me when I come home or whatever I'm up to during that day. Although I, I do work from home most days, so but it has dinner ready when my when my family comes home. <laughs> so I do a ton of soups, um, and luckily my kids just love split pea soup and broccoli soup. And, That's great. Oh yes, uh, they're pretty good vegetable eaters. I feel pretty lucky that way. We work at getting them to try new things. You know, we go to Ethiopian restaurants. We try different things. Every week we try to increase our palate a little bit. We take baby steps. They don't always like it, but they always try. That's all I can ask as a mom, I think. Absolutely. Well, speaking of kids, one of the Mm -hmm. things I really admire about you, Dawn, is that you are creating content for kids. And one of the things that you've done in the time that uh, we haven't been connected and now we are getting back together is that you've created children's books. I want to first talk about your pre-K book that's called Thank You Bugs. That is such a sweet, sweet book for pre-K kids to start to learn about. Yes, to start to learn about the beneficial aspects to insects. Yes. Well, that book sort of wrote itself. I, I had the incredible privilege of teaching gardening and establishing some raised beds at a YWCA in Minneapolis. And these kids were adorable. And so I did a little lesson and we, and we, uh, and we planted and we maintained and we learned about different things. And one of the um, lessons was about insects. I wanted to teach them a little bit about insects and those kids love to sing. And I love to sing too, even though I I can't say I'm a fantastic singer, Uh, (laughs) but they don't seem to mind. And, uh, and so I made it, I kind of wrote down all the things about why we should love insects. And then I made a little song out of it and my kids love to sing it. And so I just decided, well, maybe I should write it down as a book. And so I did that too. And I still wish I could have the song in the back of the book, um, but I am not musically inclined enough. I tried different apps and sang it into the apps and so that it would write down the music for me, but it did not sound, come out sounding how I wanted it to. So I need to find, I need to tap into some musicians to write it down for me because I don't, I don't know how to get it on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> I just, oh, I guess you can only do so much, but I had a lot of fun with emotions in that too. Cause you know, some teaching that some bugs are scary and hairy and yucky, you know, and all the things that people think about bugs, but the the truth is that they do more good in the world than bad. So sometimes we have to just tolerate their creepiness and realize that, you know, they help give us food and they pollinate a lot of the food we eat. So fun. And my son Mason was my model for those pictures I took and used in the book too. And he has some pretty good facial expressions too. Oh, he has great facial expressions. Well, and the title, Thank You Bugs, is such a great title 
for a pre-K curriculum on learning about insects. I thought that was fantastic. And then the other book that I know you're so well known for is the book called Mason Meets a Mason Bee. And it has, uh, well, first of all, a great cover and then a great subtitle. Do you want to share the subtitle with us? Oh, sure. The subtitle is An Educational Encounter with a Pollinator. I love that. I I think it's absolutely (laughs) fantastic. And this book really helps kids understand the challenges faced by mason bees and native bees. I had a chance to have you read this book to me along with your thank you bugs before we had a chance to chat. And one of the great things that you pointed out is that Heather Holm, writer and author Heather Holm, um, shared some of the photography for this book with you. All the fantastic photos are um, by Heather Holm and the close-ups of the of the mason bees and by Dave Hunter from Crown Bees. Those two uh, really deserve a lot of credit for, for being so generous to share their photos. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that the spirit of the book, the intent behind the book is so fantastic because you're very passionate about the crisis that our pollinators are facing right now. Why don't you give us a Cliff Notes version of this story of Mason meeting a Mason bee? Oh, sure. Um, well, it has a similar message in a way, underlying message uh, than as the as the Thank You Bugs book, um, that pollinators are important. That's kind of the underlying message. But this one, when I found out that there was a bee called a mason bee, and I had a son who was at the time about two named Mason, I just knew I had to write a book. It just took me a couple of years to to collect enough information and figure out what my message wanted to be. So, so um, the, the two meet, Mason the boy is afraid of bees, but he meets one sharing his own name. And so after talking to this gentle, non-stinging Mason bee, his mind is changed about bees, and he finds out that they really do a lot of good, and people are harming them in a lot of ways. So he decides at the end to be a superhero and to protect the bees and the pollinators. So I also do that book now as a puppet show, and that is a blast. I have really no business being a puppeteer. Um, Sometimes I just wonder, like, okay, I'm a German major, and I write children's books, and now I'm a puppeteer too, so (laughs) there you go. But it's so much fun. I've always loved being on stage ever since I was a kid, and it's it's a hoot. And there's not enough puppet shows around these days. Everyone loves a puppet show. I don't care how old you are. You're never too old for a puppet show, I think. Well, (laughs) I love that you've turned it into a puppet show. And the other thing that I like about your content is that you don't dumb it it down for kids. I mean, this Mason meets a Mason Bee, I think you're targeting for K through third grade, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, two of the facts that you shared in that story that I was so struck by are that Mason Bees pollinate as much as a hundred honeybees. So one mason bee is that industrious. And Isn't they, that amazing? Yeah, I thought that was a fantastic point um, for kids to really appreciate this particular species of bee. And the other thing that you say that I thought was so powerful is that insects have no voices. And so you're really using your story as a way to give the insects a voice as far as yeah. not using pesticides or, or um, what was it that you said that um, when we build our homes, we take, we basically destroy their homes. So yeah. Plant, when we take over, the Mason B is talking and say, when you build your homes, you take away ours. It would be very kind if you could plant us some flowers. It's in the vein of the Lorax. I mean, I don't even want to compare myself to Dr. Seuss. I'm no Dr. Seuss, but you know, he was speaking for the trees in the Lorax yes. and kind of in that in that light, I guess. Yes. Well, I like it because it's a nice mix of telling the story of um, basically trying to build a a bond between kids and insects so that they appreciate the job that they have to do for us in terms of pollinating our food. Um, yes. And I think you do a really nice job of it. Well, thank you. That's so nice of you to say. You know, I had a lot of feedback and a lot of people 
told me this or that, or I should change this, or their kid didn't like this or that, you know, and a lot of really good feedback. But then I had to sort of sit on it and think, okay, no, what, this is my book. And what do I want it to be? And I decided I wanted it to be a book that my kids would like. And at this point now, they're so bored with my books that they, you know, they don't, (laughs) They don't even care anymore. But at, at, at one point, they, they really liked it. And um, my kids love the Wild Kratts on PBS. I don't know if you're familiar with the Wild Kratts, the Kratts brothers. No. Uh, oh, but they, they go on these adventures and they turn in, they're, they're real life people, but they're Canadian guys. And um, they turn into cartoon characters and they go on all these adventures and they have these suits with creature powers. So they have all these, so they learn all about these animals. And um, it's so fantastic. The kids learn so much. They love the nonfiction stories. You know, a little bit of creativity and imagination in there. So this is a talking mason bee. Of course, we don't have that fiction. That's a talking mason bee. But they love the facts. They love the 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 nature and they 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 are so thirsty for facts and I found that so many children's books are so heavy on the creativity and the silly stories but not all kids like that you know they want a story and a little bit of silliness but they wanted to have a point in it and I guess they come by that naturally because that's a lot how their mother is (laughs) so so it it was really they're fun books to write Well, the great thing about your book, too, is that you now have a teacher guide, too. So I'm so curious, as you've been putting together these resources for uh, kids in schools, are you finding that there are enough resources in classrooms that are covering these types of topics? I strongly support the public schools. My kids go to the Moundsview School District and go public schools. They are just doing such a fantastic job with them. And I know that teachers are so crunched to get the the reading, writing, and arithmetic in there. So I wouldn't want to like kind of step on anyone's toes and say that maybe it's not enough. Um, but I think anything more that we can do to add extra is beneficial. And that uh, a lot of teachers maybe would like to stray a little bit from the core areas. That's not necessarily what they can do. And so this puppet show is a great way to add in some fun as a treat and some science and some literature and social studies. It really does add quite a bit, I think. And the other thing is that this is educator guide is great for not just teachers. You know, we don't just learn at school, of course. Uh, parents and any kind of caregivers or grandparents or scout leaders, these uh, lessons in there and these activities and these conversations are are ones that can happen with anyone. And sometimes I think, you know, uh, I actually think it's the perfect book for a grandparent because you have this time, a grandparent who is lucky enough to spend a little time with their, their grandchildren one-on-one and talking about these big issues. Sometimes it's hard to know what to talk about with kids, and kids love to talk about this kind of stuff, I think. Well, so. one of the things that I think you do, that you got so creative with, was when you created the whole puppet show for Mason Meets a Mason Bee. And it's a unique and very interactive way to get your message out, um, not only to within the schools, but I mean, you're out in the community, you're at community events doing this puppet show. How are people responding to it? You know, people come up and it's a conversation starter. The adults have something to add because there's enough content in there uh, for adults to learn something too. So a lot of times I'll get gardening questions afterwards and that I can wear my master gardener hat there or point people to resources. The kids, you know, are fascinated by puppets and they're wondering if they might be real. I, they know they're not real, but they, they might be. And so they're giving my, my arm a hug, me wearing that. And it's gone over very well. I'm really lucky that I have had such positive feedback. And I keep trying to tweak it and, you know, working on my voices. My voice gets really tired after I do the show a little bit because my Mason B sounds a little bit like a like a Muppet uh a Rolf the dog Muppet or something. I grew up with a Muppet. So <laughs> that's what that's the voices I can do. And I tried so many voices 
to, you know, and I just couldn't sustain them for a whole show. So finding a voice that I can keep up, that's a tricky thing to do. I'm sure it is. Well, you put a ton of energy into this show. So I can imagine that by the end, you've got nothing left to give. <laughs> oh, but it's so worth it. It's I give a lot, but I get a lot back too. That's for sure. Absolutely. And it just feels so good to... Uh, you know, reach out to people and connect with people on such an important message. Well, I'm wondering if there is another idea, you know, that you've got percolating because you've got another boy, Max, and he doesn't have I know. any books. I know. So it I was thinking about, about it could be Max and the native plants or something. Well, yes, you've hit on a big subject here. And I'm, I have a lot of mama guilt that I have not gotten around <laughs> to, uh, to do in a Maxwell book. Um, but when Max was six months old, he weighed 26 pounds, I think. And he was in the hundredth percentile for weight. He was the fattest thing you could ever imagine. I mean, I, 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 he had to wear one year old clothing because his wrists were so fat and his arms were so fat. I couldn't get the other, they just they were way too long on him, but he was so chunky. And so he got the, he got the nickname Maxwell Snackswell at that time. And so I've always thought a great book would be something about healthy eating and eating from the garden. And, and he also loves to cook. Oh my goodness. My, oh, he loves it. He's four now. I can't believe he's four. And he understands what goes into stuff. He comes up with the most unique concoctions and ideas to put stuff together. I just thought, wow, that that's a good idea. <laughs> you know, I'm going to try that. And so I have to do something that that's that's to, that's to come. Um, and he's been saying that he's going to be a chef for years. I and just he has say little chef. There you go. Yep, yeah, he's got the little outfit, and um, my desk is right next to his little play kitchen. So he knows how to use all the tools every once in a while. Like I couldn't find my whisk. And so he ran downstairs and grabbed his. We washed it off and um, I used his whisk. Wow. <laughs> He's a great kid. My dad is really into old cars. And so there's an old car called a Maxwell. And my dad actually has a Maxwell. And so he thinks it should be something about Maxwell rides in a Maxwell or something like that. But I'm no old car expert. So I told my dad, if (laughs) he wants that book written, he's retired. He's going to have to do that. So (laughs) I was just going to say, you got to stay in your wheelhouse. It's got to be something about plants. I couldn't even venture uh, into old cars. I, I I would be seen as a fraud right away. (laughs) There you go. Well, you know, when you're, when you're uh, doing the illustration for that book, you can have a Maxwell car in the background or something. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. That'll make grandpa happy, but yes, yes. I agree. It's got to be something, uh, either vegetables or natives or a combination or something like that, because it just seems like such a good next step. Well, I want to make sure as a as one of our last questions here that we talk about this Pledge to Plant campaign that you're passionate about. Oh, yes. The Pledge to Plant campaign was started by the West Metro Water Alliance, and it's being hosted on the Blue Thumb website, so bluethumb.org, and then it's all over that website. <clears throat> and so we're Educating people to know about why, you know, the whole the whole name of the campaign is Pledge to Plant for Pollinators and Clean Water. All the good things that especially native plants and rain gardens and shoreline plantings can do to help with environmental issues. And we're keeping track and tracking it and reaching out to people if they need help and offering assistance and because this is, is new for a lot of people. And it's going kind of nationwide, too. So the the Blue Thumb program is catching on across the country. So that's really a lot of fun. Well, and for upcoming events, you're going to be at the Minnesota Great Get-Together. You're going to be at the State Fair this year. I sure am. I look forward to that every year. It's so much fun. The crowds are always so relaxed, and they're just there to have fun. And I'll be in the Agriculture Horticulture Building and also in the Eco Experience Building. And you're going to be talking about Yard 2.0, which is based on your Lawn Chair Gardener book. I am, yes. Yeah, it's kind of the the new version of lawns. It seems like what's catching on is a lot of people are 
the pollinators have captured a lot of people's attention and people want to do things differently in their yard and maybe veer a little bit away from some turf grass and, and do things a little differently. So this is why I call it the yard 2.0. And then I'll also be doing my puppet show a few times too. Okay. Well that's, Oh, at the, at the state fair. Yes. On the dirt stage. at the. Isn't that funny? I love the, the dirt stage. That's what it's called. Um, it, it's in the agriculture horticulture building. Well, I tell you what, people, if they haven't had a chance to catch it, this will be a great opportunity for them at the Minnesota State Fair to see Don Pape for Lawn Chair Gardener or also Mason Meets a Mason Bee puppet show. So that'll be fantastic. Well, uh, Don, how do we get a hold of you? What what's a, what are where are you at on social media? I am on Facebook and Twitter, and my website is lawnchairgardener.com. And today yeah. you're going to be giving away a copy of your Lawn Chair Gardener book to a lucky listener. So we'll encourage people to join our Facebook group, our new Facebook group, and we'll pick a lucky listener from that group. So that will be a, a good bonus for people to check it out on Facebook. Awesome. All right. Well, Don, I want to thank you for being on the show today. This was absolutely fantastic. The pleasure was all mine. Well, that's it for our show today. I want to thank Don Pape, P-A-P-E, of the Lawn Chair Gardener for being my guest. And I also want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, David Myers, Ein Kadena, and David Gregerson. I could not get the show put together without these guys. Just a reminder that I'll have all the generous information that Don shared on the show today in the show notes under the Still Growing Podcast page under my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A. A.com, and that's the home of Still Growing. And if you really like the show, I'd love to invite you to join the Still Growing podcast group on Facebook. Just remember, it's a closed group. All you have to do is search for Still Growing podcast group and then request to join and I'll let you in the group. You can share your own garden stories, interact with the great guests featured on Still Growing, and you can connect with other listeners of the show. And don't forget that that is where I will post all of the great giveaways like the Lawn Chair Gardener Guide by Don Pape from my guests and sponsors for my lucky listeners. So if you have a desire to win that book, get in that group. Don't forget, I'll also be posting September 1st about the online book club of All the President's Gardens by Marta McDowell. So if you'd like to join that group, you can do that there as well. So go ahead and check it out. I'd love to meet you in the Still Growing Podcast group on Facebook. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow.